think we'll get underway. Um, we have about 30 people registered for this meeting, um, but it, we have, presumably people will, some people will join us as we continue onwards. But welcome to this online public meeting. Um, and first of all, an, an apology. I'm Mike Russell. I'm the chair of the Scottish Land Commission. An apology for us not being in Thurso tonight. Uh, we had intended to be there to hold a public meeting tonight and to have a commission meeting tomorrow and uh, to make some visits tomorrow. But restrictions that we're working under at the moment meant that the, ha this had to be cancelled. Um, and However, we do have a commitment, and I, I'm happy to make that commitment, that we will uh, visit on a future date. And um, instead of eyeballing us at the public meeting tonight, it seems sensible that we did at least try to have an online meeting and to, to be available and to answer questions. And indeed, the entire board of the Land Commission is on this call. Um, Dr. Sally Ra Roberts, Professor De De uh, Deb Roberts, Lauren McLeod, Craig McKenzie, Bob McIntosh, the Tenant Farming Commissioner, and our CEO, Hamish Trench, and our Head of Land Rights and Responsibilities, uh, Emma Cooper, are all here. And all will um, answer questions at some stage, I hope, uh, this evening. Um, after a brief introduction to the Commission, we will be open to question. Um, I'm sure we will all want to participate. Likely, I would think, around an hour or so of questions, if that's what people want. No doubt the current um, Land Reform Bill will be a topic. Uh, and we as a commission are working very hard on that, offering advice to both the government and to the parliament. But we'll be happy to respond on other issues as far as we can and as wide a range of issues as people uh, want to raise. But uh, what we'll do first is have a look, brief look at this um, uh, PowerPoint, which gives a, 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 an overview of the commission and, and how we're organised. And then um, I'll ask each of the commissioners to say just a brief word or two, um, and then we'll get on with the questions and discussion. So thank you for attending and let's have a look at this um, uh, uh, PowerPoint. Um, Scarlett, would you just like to move to the next slide? This is the board of the Scottish Land Commission, where it's a non-departmental public body. We were established in 2017 by the, the, by the Land Reform Scotland Act of 2015-16. And the commission is supported within the rural department of the Scottish government. And the committee that scrutinises us um, is the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee of the Scottish Parliament. And our role, as this says, is to provide leadership and advice about land ownership in Scotland. Um, and uh, we, as a small and I hope fairly um, fleet of foot body, we're very engaged, as I said, on that at the moment with the new land reform bill, but also on a wide range of topics, some of which may come up tonight. Um, can we have the next slide? Um, our we have a vision of land being accessible and supporting thriving people and places. Um, our mantra really is people, power and prosperity. We want to see people empowered in Scotland through access to, to land and control of land. Uh, we want to make sure that people uh, are comfortable with the way in which land is managed and administered in Scotland and that it is done within the public interest. And we are very aware of the economic, social and cultural rights and the history that drives Scotland's approach to land reform. And our next slide, please. And that really emphasises what we're about, people, power and prosperity. We want people to participate in decisions about land. We want the power and control of land to be shared more widely. And we want the prosperity that will arise of that uh, to spread throughout Scotland, and not just in rural Scotland. It's very important to emphasise that we see our mission and our vision covering the whole of Scotland. And next slide, this we have, this is probably quite small to see on most computers. This is our commission staff structure, but we have a small staff working out of Inverness. And Scarlett, our board structure. This is our board structure and the board members are here tonight. Uh, so you will recognize them from their photographs. And thank you. We meet nine times a year. Uh, the schedule includes meetings in person, meetings online, and meetings at locations throughout Scotland. And we want to restart our programme of meetings throughout Scotland as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. I think we've got more people joining us now. So, um, Sally, would you like to say a quick word, word and then we'll go around the board and then we'll get started with questions. Just say, Good give evening. Us background. Uh, evening, everybody. It's lovely to be here with you. Um, I'd much rather be with you all in a, in a village hall, but but this is what we can do. So uh, my name is Sally Reynolds. Um, I'm from the Western Isles. 
um, and I've been a land commissioner for eight years now. So I'm in my, my last few months before I step down. Um, I am a crofter and I previously worked for a community landowner and I currently work for a trust port. So a bit of a varied background, but really enjoyed my time at the commission and looking forward to hearing your questions and, and listening to your experiences of land. Uh, Lauren? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lauren McLeod. Uh, very happy to be here tonight to, to listen to the discussion and uh, enjoy the debate. Um, my background is that uh, I was the chair of uh, Community Land Scotland before I became a commissioner. Been involved with uh, land reform for about 30 years. A long time ago, I went to school in Caithness and I've got family in Sutherland, so hopefully I know a bit about the areas covered this evening. So very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Deb? Yep. Hello, everybody. I'm Deb Roberts, and I became a land commissioner in February. So I'm one of the relatively new new people on the on the board. Um, I'm speaking from Fife at the moment, but like Sally and Lauren, I wish I was up in uh, Thurso with you. Um, I my background is I'm a rural economist, so I've uh, I'm an academic actually. So I've sort of studied and tried to understand how rural economies are different from um, urban economies and what drives their development. And one thing that's always fascinated me and I think is absolutely critical is the role of land in that process. So um, like the others, I'm really looking forward to hearing what, what issues you raised tonight. Thank you. Craig. Hi there, uh, I'm Craig McKenzie. I'm, I'm based in Edinburgh. Uh, I've, most of my career has been spent working for uh, investment companies. Uh, I've, I've led sustainable investment teams at, at Scottish Widows and Aberdeen and various other companies. Uh, and I, I've had a, a fair bit of experience in natural capital investment, which, as I'm sure you've, you're, you're aware, is a uh, potential opportunity for um, remote rural Scotland. Um, there's there's significant opportunities in, in um, Caithness and Sutherland to further restore um, the peatlands that, that you have in, in huge quantity, um, but also more widely in the Highland region, there's opportunity to, to restore native woodlands and, and, and plant trees and sequester carbon and help meet uh, net zero goals. Um, of course, there's a fair bit of controversy um, whenever you do uh, something new uh, and whenever money's involved, uh there's there's debate about uh quite how it should be done and who should benefit so uh, we at the land commission have, have been working quite hard on on natural capital to ensure that um community benefit is is addressed uh and to understand how uh natural capital can make the biggest contribution to uh the rural economy in in scotland so that's my my main area of interest i'm i'm an academic at edinburgh university now and I'm researching uh, various topics in, in this area and see, see how we can develop better policy uh, in Scotland on, on, on this topic. Thank you. Bob? Hi, I'm uh, Bob McIntosh. Uh, my background is in uh, forestry and land management, which I've spent a long career in. I currently sit on the board as Scotland's Tenant Farming Commissioner, so my role there is to promote good relations between landlords and tenants of agricultural holdings by providing guidance, by issuing codes of practice that influence the way landlords and tenants behave, and generally helping to mediate where there are difficulties arising between landlords and tenants. Thank you. Hamish. Hello, my name is Trench. Uh, I'm Chief Executive at the Land Commission, um, so I lead the staff team. Uh, we have a small staff team of around 18 people based in Inverness, uh, and I live in Granton on Spey. And Emma. Hi, Emma Cooper, Head of Land Rights and Responsibilities. My team uh, lead the Good Practice Programme, so we help landowners of all type, public, private, charitable and so on, to think about what responsible land ownership might look like and help them to implement that. All of my team have managed land in some way, shape or form um, in the past, and some still do, in fact. And uh, my background is around community land ownership. Thanks. 
Thank you. And I'm Mike Russell. I uh, have a background in politics, but I've been deeply involved in land reform through that, both as uh, previously the member of the Scottish Parliament for Argyll and Butte, and also I sat on the committee that passed the 2016 um, bill. So I'm very pleased to be now the chairman of the Land Commission, and I took up my post, as Deb said. We had a, an influx of new blood on the 1st of February this year. And of course, we are now in the process of recruiting for uh, successor to Sally, Lorne and Bob, whose term is coming to an end. And that process will come to fruition before the end of the year. So that's a, a, an overview of who we are and what we do. Um, we would welcome questions or comments from anybody if they would raise their hand um, on the software. That would be helpful to know what people wanted to ask. Or um, most people don't have their cameras on, but those who have their cameras on can also physically raise their hand. And they can also put something in the chat if they wish. Um, any first taker? This is always the hardest part to get somebody to come in first. Oh, yes, please. On you go. Uh, on you go. You're still muted, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. That's I, I helped write the CELAC all those years ago and also the first time to be. Land Reform Act in 2003. I struggled on with the, North, the project in North Highland Way because we couldn't get a community group together. So basically I'm doing it uh, with the help of all kinds of different sponsors, even Tesco's and the North Link. So we're actually not doing bad seeing as we've got no public money. But we keep coming across difficulties. For example, I found today that they're going to try and knock down the, uh, the bridge at the head of Naver, which is a listed building, so um, which is not great. But there are all kinds of other difficulties. I'm not sure how many um, uh, meetings, for example, that the councils are supposed to have to discuss um, access every year. We had a lot of um, difficulties with, the, with, with access. Nothing's been done in, in the Highland Council area for about five or six years. And now they're finally having to look at it again because MSP Edward Mountain has stepped up and said that we need to review SOAC. So my question would be that in terms of access, public access, would we be looking at um, underpinning that with another review of the Land Commission in that, refer that re regard? Right, public access. Who would like to tackle this one? Emma, are you involved in the issues of public access? Thanks, Mike. Um, so just in case anybody doesn't know, SOAC is the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, um, and that's what Tina is referring to. So outdoor access isn't part of our remit. It actually sits with Nature Scott. So I can help you make a connection there if there's some questions you want to ask them, but it's not really part of our remit. Sometimes where we do get involved in access issues, it's when um, owners and managers of land and communities are having general communication difficulties or they're having conflict around particular issues and sometimes we can help just ease that communication um, and help everybody to understand what kind of engagement should take place around um, access but the actual legislative responsibility for access very much sits with Nature Scott and not with the Land Commission. Sorry okay. yeah um, sorry can I just say yeah, I, kind of, I kind of knew that but sometimes it's hard to get an answer. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. And, uh, you know, any questions here are welcome. Obviously, there's lots of public bodies out there. They all have different responsibilities. So any questions along those lines about what the Land Commission does and doesn't do are absolutely welcome this evening. Thanks, Tina. Anybody else like to join in um, with any comments on it? No. Um, are further questions from anybody? I'm just replying to John Barry asking, why could you not be here physically? Well, there are general restrictions on public expenditure at the present moment, and we're a small body. Those restrictions are, you know, have a, a severe effect on us because we don't spend very much money. So if we're trying to restrict spending money, then that has an effect, and it, that is what we uh, presently are having to do. So by not going out to hold a meeting out with Inverness, we are saving a little money. I don't want that to continue for very long, but I think it's a sensible thing to have to do given the restrictions we're facing. Other um, other questions from individuals? Well, I 
Dina, you're keeping us going. That's good. It's going while somebody else thinks. Um, sorry, I was uh, thinking about the, the 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 land reform bill that you've got now. How is that going to align with the Climate Change Act? Well, that's a that's a very that's a very good question. I'm going to start. I think Craig looks like a man who wants to start answering that question, um, and then we'll move on and see if other people have things to say too. Craig, on you go. So, so one way that I think it will be helpful with with regard to the Climate uh, Change Act is the proposed requirement for there to be mandatory land management plans for large landowners. Um, the the um, land rights and responsibility statement, which which mentions climate change objectives. Um, expects landowners to consider opportunities to address um, climate goals in their management of land. Um, but as things stand, it's very hard to assess whether any given la large landowner is managing their land in a way that um, responds to the, the climate emergency and, and for that matter, um, the biodiversity crisis that we have. Um, so the land um, management plan provision in the bill, um, I think will create some helpful transparency for large landowners uh, and allow us to um, get a clearer sense. And by us, I mean that the, the communities who, who live near uh, the, the larger estates, but also the land commission and the Scottish government itself and the, and the wider public it will allow us to uh, get a better sense of, of which landowners are restoring their damaged feet, which landowners are um, have plans for for renewables on their land, which landowners um, are planting trees to sequester carbon or have plans to extend their planting. So at the moment, it is sometimes possible to patch some of that information together. Uh, certainly historically, by looking at kind of planning consents and and. Scottish forestry documentation, but it's really quite difficult to do, and you you really need to be a bit of an expert to do it. So with with mandatory land management plans, it will become, um, hopefully, uh, if if uh, we, we get it right, um, it will be a lot easier um, to do that and to to assess um, progress by large landowners. So um, of course the 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 land reform bills. Primary goal isn't isn't uh, net zero, but I I do think it will be helpful by by encouraging more transparency. Thank you. And it is transparency is in the public interest here, as is the observation the, 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 the you know, observing best practice uh, as far as the climate change imperatives are concerned. And this is all bound up in that issue of, of public interest. We have to make sure that whatever happens with Scotland's land its management and its administration is in the public interest. Um, and therefore, having more information, having these plans, making sure that these plans are available to be compared one with another. And I think the Land Commission is a, the right body to hold those plans and to have those uh, made available to people will be, will be of significance and will allow us to understand that the public interest is being served. And I think that's extremely important. Um, Anybody else like to join in that one? Because we've got another question in the in the in the um, chat bar, and I'm happy to take. Yes, Deb, on you go. Yes, yeah, so well, I'm going to be stepping hugely on Bob toes here, actually. <laughs> so I'll pass it. It's like a ball throwing yeah. ball. But I guess the other area of connection is the, in terms of the tenancy reforms and the fact that the land reform bill is um, suggesting that. Uh, we recognise that tenants can carry out actions that are associated with um, redressing the climate emergency as opposed to only agricultural activities on their land. So, Bob, I probably messed that up a little bit, but I think that's the other key, I think, connection with the Land Reform Bill and, and the question. Yeah. Bob, do you want to add anything to that in terms of... No, I think what Deb said is absolutely right. Global... At the moment, the way the law stands, if you're a, a tenant farmer, you're restricted to doing things that might be classified as agriculture. We're now beginning to see the definition of agriculture being very much broadened to include other nature-friendly and climate-friendly activities. 
And one of the aims of the upcoming land reform bill, as Deb said, is to make sure that tenants can engage in those activities without inadvertently being seen to be in breach of their tenancy. Sally, you looked as if you wanted to say something. Well, I was just going to build on that by by building on that to say that the, there is also consultations happening just now regarding a crofting bill that are at a much earlier stage, but they obviously also involve land. And they're actually addressing those very same points that Bob and Deb just talked about in terms of tenancies going into different things and those kind of peatland restorations on common grazings. So those conversations are actually going a step further um, within that consultation as well. So it's quite an interesting topic at the moment. Good. Thank you. Uh, Ian Berry Bowers has a, a, a question in the chat bar, which says, with regard to peat and restoration, how important is the national natural capital investment potential? Can it make a significant difference without becoming mere greenwashing? That is a question that we ourselves have asked um, and continue to ask. So I think it's a very good question to address. Craig, do you want to come in and start this one again? But I know others will want to, to contribute to it. Hamish may well wish to contribute to it, given some of the work he's been doing too. Craig. Yeah, so so Peatland uh, in Scotland is, is very important to achieving our net zero goals as, as a country. Uh, peat, peat emissions are somewhere around 15% of, of um, Scotland's emissions. So, so up there with the household sector. Um, and and the, the, the irony is that peat is actually a, a brilliant um, store of carbon. Uh, if, if you have healthy peat bog, you're sequestering carbon at a rate of about a tonne per hectare per year um, in perpetuity. Um, the problem is that, that around 80% of Scotland's peat is damaged um, because in the 1950s, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, as it then was in its wisdom, decided that we needed more uh, land for, for grazing and, and so put in tens of thousands of drains in, into the UK's peat bog. Um, there are other, other problems too, but that, that's probably the most significant one. Um, but that was before we knew about climate change. Now we realise that if you, if you damage peat, um, it emits carbon. Uh, quite significant amounts of carbon, about between three and ten um, tons of carbon per hectare per year. So, so we need to fix that. And uh, in Scotland, we have a huge amount of uh, something like twenty percent of Scottish land mass is is peatland, and about eighty percent of that is damaged. So, we have a huge amount of peat to restore. And at the moment, uh, that restoration is happening um, almost entirely via public subsidy. Um, and it costs about a thousand pounds a hectare to, to to restore peat. In fact, that's the cheapest it costs. It can cost up above two thousand pounds a hectare. So, in in these uh, difficult days of, of, of straightened fiscal uh, conditions, um, we need to try and find ways to to bring other sources of finance to bear, uh, of funding to bear, to 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 restore peat. And so, this is this is where the the um, peatland code. Uh, came in with the idea that you might um, sell carbon credits to um, companies with net zero targets uh, so that they might um, pay for peat to be restored in order to offset some of their own emissions. Um, and the Peatland Code, I think, is widely regarded as a, a high quality code backed by good science. So, so there's no greenwashing there. Um, the, the, the concern is that um, people might sell peatland credits to companies um, that then use those credits to, to justify business as usual. Um, and, and so you get no net gain for the climate. You get a bit more peat restored, which is not a bad thing, but you, you get no net gain for the climate. Um, and, and say if an oil company is, is doing that, then, then I think many would reasonably enough regard that as greenwash so the challenge is to um, tighten the code so credits can only be sold to companies that demonstrate that they have an aggressive carbon emission strategy and so the purchase of any peatland credit units uh, is in addition to their uh, ambitious climate agenda so that there's no question that it's justifying business as usual 
and there are there are now plenty of companies that that kind of meet that tougher criteria. Uh, so so I'm fairly optimistic that that we will be able to make um, make that work, and it will bring significant additional funding um, to to peat restoration in Scotland. Um, but there are there are a few other hurdles that that will need to be overcome as well. But but I I, I am hopeful that we will be able to make progress on that. Thank you. Hamish, particularly, perhaps you might touch on the issue of community benefit, um, which is something yeah. that we've been concerned with. Yeah, I, mean, I think just a, a wider reflection on the role of private finance in, in peatland or other natural capital is, yes, of course, it can have a role, but we need to make sure that this is done fairly uh, and, that, and that it's done effectively. Uh, and one of the one of the key things in that is making sure that private finance, where it does come into the system, is benefiting local communities um, as an integral part of the projects. So we spent quite a bit of time over the last couple of years. We've uh, published some guidance on community benefit from land and natural capital. That's a really clear expectation that Scottish government have backed that where there is private finance coming into peatland or woodland natural capital, for example, uh, there should be real tangible community benefits. Uh, and these are benefits that should be agreed, discussed, negotiated locally um, with the relevant communities. So I think that that is a you know a key part of our focus on on helping government make sure that where private finance is coming into the system, that actually the right policies, the right frameworks have been put in place to to manage this so that it can be done uh, fairly and, and usefully. Thank you. Um, the chat bar, um, uh, Scarlett in in our comms office is running this is very usefully in putting uh, links into the um, chat bar that refer to things that are like uh, how you should just been talking about the guidance on the respons responsible approach to delivering community benefits. So that might be useful to people uh, to take away as well. Um, other questions or comments uh, from people who are present? Thank you, Mr. Berry Bowers, who thinks they were great replies. So I'm sure uh, my colleagues were pleased with that. Anna McConnell, how do you think a balance can be struck between digging peat bogs up and felling trees to create wind farms and associated new energy networks with peatlands restoration. Seems we are spending money restoring peatlands whilst digging them up just as quickly for renewable energy. That is a, an interesting issue. Um, who would like to start on this? Sally, would you like to try and address a conundrum between peatland restoration and 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 and, um, and wind farms? Because that is an issue that has, I think, been touched on in where you live. Thank you. Yeah, we have a we have an uh, we have an interesting issue with this as well so we have um we do have a lot of renewable developments where we are some community owned and some not and we're actually just um following grid constraints we're just going to come up to a boom time on this um but it has been it has been a really um difficult conundrum for our community and and for our landowners and i think what's important is we have to go back to um thinking about what the land is suitable for and a lot of our land isn't suitable for forestry because it's peatland um, or it's potentially been damaged by um, forestry on unsuitable ground in the past. So you need to look at restoring that and how you do it. Um, and I don't I don't think I'm I'm unpicking the question there because I think it's I I think it's quite it's quite difficult, but I think the most important thing is that we do the right things in the right places. And I think what's important with that is as with some of the things that have already been mentioned, land management plans, transparency, speaking to your communities and understanding um, what's right for the right place. Um, I think it's we've seen some very failed forestry because they've been done in the wrong places. Um, but I don't think so. I think we're in a slightly different scenario where we're getting that restored um, for different reasons. But, yeah, I don't think. I think it's just important that we do the right things in the right places um, and we always look to the future with that. Lauren, Lauren, the benefit that can come to communities from renewables is very considerable. And I think mean, every community that you know, looks at its future will be looking at renewables. But there is an issue that Anna is raising here, uh, that uh, going hell for leather on renewables may actually have other consequences. How much does that enter into the discussion uh, within communities? Well, I think, you know, an important issue that uh, Anna has uh, has raised there 
um, you know, maybe harping back to the land reform bill proposals, you know, I think I would also come in and see that, you know, adequate community engagement and, and that's the effective community engagement will hopefully lead to land management plans which take in the balance that needs to be struck for all the developments, whether we're talking about renewables, but also talking about uh, kind of peat bog uh, restoration. Um, but you're right, uh, Chair, that uh, there are significant benefits that can be realised from renewable energy. Uh, I, I don't think we're just talking about the community benefit of £5,000 per megawatt installed, but I, I think the new development uh, and very much being encouraged is shared ownership of some of the onshore wind farms, which can produce significantly additional benefits for communities. Um, and I know that there are quite a few examples of communities that are working to that end at the moment. Um, but I think in terms of the question that Anna uh, has raised, you know, we really need to have effective community engagement. And one of the proposals in the land reform bill currently uh, pitched at those uh, landowners over 3,000 hectares or different rules for island communities, but over 3,000 hectares will have a, a legislative uh, requirement to do effective community engagement. And one of the changes that is coming to the Land Commission in the future, if the bill goes through as proposed, is that there will be a new Land and Communities Commissioner which will be able to investigate any referrals from communities of things uh, if, if it's felt there hasn't been effective engagement or there are issues around land management plans. So that's an interesting uh, move in the future. Back to you, yes. Chair. And Bryony has put into the, um, thank you very much, has put into the chat bar, uh, information about uh, the Green Financial Initiative and looking at how local communities in the flow country can benefit from peatland finance. So I don't know if we've seen that, but that will be a useful thing for us to take away and, and, and have a look at and study. So thank you for that. Uh, Bryony, do you want to say anything about it? No. Okay. Um, Hamish, on you go. I was just going to say, if we if we had been uh, actually travelling in person to, to or so, we were going to hopefully uh, meet and hear a little bit more about the Green Finance Initiative in the Flow Country, um, which I think is, you know, it is a, a great example, actually, of trying to make sure that the communities are really well embedded in, in looking at the community benefit. But Emma, I don't know if do you want to just say a wee bit, Emma, about the kind of um, resource and support that we're working with others on, um, because community benefit is a very new concept in natural capital. Uh, and we are looking to extend it well beyond the, the focus that it's had in renewables at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So as Hamish referenced earlier, our guidance on community benefits from land takes quite a broad perspective of what benefits might look like. So thinking about things around community ownership of land or transfer of uh, leasing land, that kind of thing, as well as thinking about local jobs and employment, thinking about improved access rights, thinking about... Um, all of those things that we can use land for and how do, we, how do we best make the most of that opportunity. So to support that guidance, we've been working with a number of different investors, landowners to, to test that out, to try it out. And we have seen some really good progress on that in some places. And we're just working at the moment to put together a funding package for some people who will be there to support both communities, landowners, investors, project developers with this to help them really work through what that could look like in their circumstances, in their context, really seeking to find benefits that the community wants to happen. So things that the community feel um, are needed for their community or that they aspire to and thinking about how that land and that project can support that those needs and those aspirations moving forward um, and trying to take that kind of broader perspective with it. So we've got somebody at the moment who is looking to develop a route map for how you go from a starting point with this to thinking about how you could put an actual agreement in place between uh, a project developer, investor, landowner and a community, something that's really open, transparent, that's measurable, um, that everybody can sign up to and, and agree to. 
Um, and that hopefully will start to help move some of these conversations along a bit as well. So we'll be working with quite a few different projects over the next year. Um, and yeah, really helpful to know about other projects that you know about and really helpful to hear this evening if there are any kind of um, anything that that sort of brings to mind for you today. So what is it maybe in your area that you think the land should be delivering? What are those kind of needs for yourselves? Yeah. And thanks, Bryony. That's great. Um, right. Other people, other contributions. And um, Brian is on contact uh, contacts for people. Anna um, is come back in. Uh, the benefits for the communities from most wind farms is very very thin slice of the vast profits that were generated will never be seen in the Highlands or indeed Scotland, as many of the companies financing and owning wind farms are located a long way from here. Be interesting to see some researching into this. So we have facts and figures available and discussing with communities and planners. Is this something the Land Commission could do? That's uh, really important and interesting. And speaking, I'm speaking from Argyle, and that is an issue that is presently confronting a number of communities within, particularly within Cowell. So Emma, are you going to start in on this? Yeah, I was going to say, I think a few people uh, on the board could talk to this subject, actually, but... Um, it, it is really important that we make sure that there's a, a fair distribution of these benefits um, and that 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 slice of the profits um, is is fairly distributed. So where communities have owned wind turbines themselves, for example, they're obviously seeing a much greater return financially from that project, as well as having control over different aspects of the project. So they can they can fit it around themselves you know, in, in better ways, basically. Um, so Community Land Scotland have got some um, research on this. Hamish might be about to um, tell you a bit more about it, but I'll find it um, and put the link in the chat. So we do know a bit more about that um, than we did before. And it's definitely something that when we're thinking about land use going forward, all of these different types of land use, we really need to be making sure that we're doing something that's evidence based, but, but really thinking about that fair distribution of things. Hamish. Hamish. Well, I'm just going to add, I think it's a very interesting time on this and people are rethinking, I think, this approach on the renewables. So very interesting to see Highland Council's proposal recently um, setting out an expectation that, um, you know, renewables should be providing not just the £5,000 per megawatt, but a further £7,500 per megawatt, megawatt for a more regional kind of level benefit. So I think thinking is changing quite, quite quickly on this. In terms of research, uh, we'll also be publishing within the next month uh, some research that looks at international practice around um, governance of natural resources. So not specifically just about renewables, but looking at um, the way different countries have approached governance and renewables in terms of securing public value and making sure that a fair share of the public value comes back for community and public benefit. And then one of the really interesting examples there actually is, uh, is Denmark, which uh, requires 20% of all wind farms to be community owned. And, um, you know, there, there's one way of doing it. Uh, other countries as well have different approaches that I think we could learn quite a bit from. Lauren, and then Tina is going to come back in. Lauren? Yeah, I was just briefly wanting to follow up on that in answering Anna's point. You know, I'm based in Oban and, and we've got a meeting coming up very soon, which is looking at potentially there are three or four wind farm developments surrounding this area. And we are looking at our own community being involved as perhaps shareholders in that. This is this shared ownership concept. And it's very interesting. And, and I know Anna will know uh, Mark Brennan, who is the kind of shared ownership manager at Local Energy Scotland, because he has a connection up in the North Coast. Um, and it might be useful to just, you know, make a contact with him and me invite him to some of the community meetings along the North Coast that are looking at a, or throughout Keithness a, and, and Sutherland that are looking at wind farm developments to just look at the possibilities of potentially a, a larger income stream because I think you're right to point out that the £5,000 per megawatt installed which has been in place for many years now and hasn't increased uh, at the same rate as the returns from uh, that are uh, given to energy companies. So, you know, we, we really need to look at uh, increased returns to communities uh, in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Tina. 
Yeah, we're talking about wind farms, but don't forget we've got the Sutherland Space Hub. I was out there the other day. It's actually quite interesting what they're doing with their peak that they're digging out of the road and putting it into the uh, the scarred landscape, as, as, as you described it, which had been digging before. But I think there's much more that can be done like that about that. I've got a 215-page report on the Sutherland um, from the UK Space Agency, and there are all sorts of, well, I'm doing economics and renewable energy at um, area what at the moment, doing my MSc. So I've actually dug that report out, and um, basically my professor Kerr is a um, marine scientist. So he was, when, the, when we looked at it briefly, he thought, oh my goodness me, look at that. I said, well, yeah. But, you know, we have to look at it more closely now. And I found all sorts, now I've actually printed it out. I found all sorts of, beginning to feel all sorts of gaps in it, you know, which I'll be bringing to his attention over the next few weeks to see if we can get a research package put together. It's, no, it's not just the wind farms. And who's to say they're not going to put another space hub somewhere else? Yeah, and, and then the sports are proliferating um, all of Kintyre, Scotland. There seems to be, US, there seems to be a, an increasing interest in firing things off into, into the atmosphere. So that's another mm -hmm. possibility for communities. So there can't be an unlimited market for them, I'm absolutely sure. Um, right, uh, any further points or questions? Um, anybody want to raise other issues, for example, about the land reform bill? We've not had any discussion yet about the lotting proposals, for example, the land reform bill, which is a jar of fairly radical um, intervention in the market and which we are working very hard on to, to try and see how they will work and, and how they could, they could operate effectively. Any other points? If the, I hear, um, right, um, Emma's put into the chat bar some a links to useful sources of information. Thank you very much, Emma, for that. Um, and Emma's contacts are there. Right, anything else? If not, I'm going to draw things together. Um, the board will be meeting tomorrow, regrettably not meeting on Thursday, but our board will be meeting tomorrow on some of these issues will be on the agenda and will continue to be on the agenda as we move forward, particularly with the with the bill. Any last thoughts from um, individual members of the board? Anything people would like to say? If not, I'm going to then draw this to a conclusion. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, there's been some interesting chat and some interesting issues raised. We've got a, a record of some of the things that we've been told and um, the information also is on the chat bar for others to 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 take away and to use. But thank you for coming along, and um, thanks very much for being there. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>